Welcome to Uriah Heep, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing, some were dancing. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, here on this fan-based, band-endorsed podcast, and we are in for an epic show today. I have no idea how long this show is going to uh, to be. You guys can already tell because you can just look down at uh, whatever your pod, uh, podcast app is and you can tell. Uh, for me, I'm expecting it's it's going to be a bit long. The uh, There are two versions of Salisbury that we're going to talk about today. Mainly the first one, I have a few notes on the unreleased version of Salisbury that you can find on the deluxe CD, uh, but it doesn't have any additional content. Um, it's, it's somewhat edited and very oddly. So we'll talk about that after we talk about the primary song. But the primary song is like 16 minutes and 17 seconds long, I think it is. So there's going to be a lot to unpack because there are a lot of changes, a lot of different parts, uh, a lot of uh, great things in this song. Uh, you know, we uh, we don't have Mick back yet, but uh, he did a two episodes of uh, Ask Mick where people wrote in about Salisbury and uh, and they had some interesting questions. He uh, just to kind of summarize. Uh, now, the first uh, one that he did was when they were still working on the box set. And so he had gone back and listened to the Salisbury album, which he hadn't in a while. And he said he was just blown away by the the album. But but this song, um, the song did feature, as he said, a 27 piece brass section. Now, I'm not sure if that was the total brass and woodwinds or just the brass section, but there are brass and woodwinds. There are no strings and percussion. So it is not a complete orchestra but definitely uh, very strong brass and some uh, some nice effects on the woodwinds in this song. Um, now, the thing is, guys, I don't know if if you all are familiar with how record companies work. They will front the money for the studio. They will front the money for any of those additional things, for the marketing and all of that stuff. But they expect that they're going to make that back between album sales and mainly when bands are touring. Now, that was more... Uh, in the 70s, when uh, when the tours were really supporting the albums, they kind of do now, but not to the same extent that they do or that they did back then. But uh, because it, uh, in that time, though, that was how it worked. And um, so they fronted the cost for the musicians to come and perform on the song. But when it comes down to it, that all comes out of the band's royalties on the back end. So they will say, you know, here's your your uh, your percentage of the sales minus all of the costs of the recording and and all of that and uh, whatever advances were given to the members and and all of that. So uh, it it really is one of those things where when you're in the studio or you're writing the songs, you know, oh, it would be really cool if we had that. And then you know, the you say it to the record company, the record company goes, yeah, we could do that. But in the end, you're the one that's paying for it. So. Uh, you know, that comes out of the royalties. So that's something that, that you have to consider when you're making those decisions as a band. Um, the other question that was actually asked on on both episodes was, would you consider playing it live? And, you know, he talked about a couple of things that are really important. First of all, uh, everybody would have to be on board to do it. And this is a lot to take on. This isn't just like, hey, you know, let's do Time to Live or let's do the park, you know, see how it goes on stage. Like this is something that takes a lot to learn, a lot to uh, get the timing and the precision out of it and and the emotional level and, and all of that. So there's there's a ton to it. Plus, you would have to decide whether you were going to bring in the Brass and Woodwind section again or or not. And then if you're not going to, do you need to do a new arrangement of the song to compensate for the fact that some of the things that they really enhance and support might sound too light and empty without them being there? So there's a lot to consider. The other component of that that he mentioned, and, and this is very true, they only get to play so long in a concert. And this is a very long song. So again, you would have to make the choice of if we're going to do this song, we have to eliminate a lot of other stuff because they do have songs that are long, like Magician's Birthday, for example. And, 
if you're going to do this song, you have to cut out a lot of other stuff to make room for it to uh, make sure that you're not going over that a lot of time that you have. And, you know, a lot of times they're they're doing uh, full shows with another band. Like when I saw them with Priest, Priest played a full set. So there's there's really a lot to consider there as well. Those are the most important components. The cost, uh, and that includes, you know, if you're not using the local orchestra, you have to bring them over from wherever they're at to be at the venue, which is going to add a lot to the cost. And then you've got the time factor. And then, you you know, everybody needs to be 100% on board if you're going to do a song like this. So... Uh, who knows? I mean, it could happen if if the band did, um, let's say, headlined a festival like or even even just their own show with uh, another band or two at a huge venue like uh, Wacken. And it was going to be filmed. And, you know, I, I don't know what this the capacity of that crowd is, but that is it's it's a sea of people. Every show that I've seen that's been filmed there, it, it's got to be it's got to be 100,000, I have to say. I mean, I could be wrong, but I, I would think it has to be at least that. It's just it's just huge. And uh, I would think it would have to be something like that. You would want to film it. So there's so many things involved in doing it. I think it would be a, an amazing song to see live. Um, I think it would be amazing to see it done it, with full uh, full energy, with the orchestra, with um, you know everybody. That could be pretty incredible. However, um, the cost of doing that would probably be uh, quite immense. So there would have to be a, a pretty good reason for anyone to front that money. And um, I don't know, maybe the DVD sales would be expected to be high or something because that's a song that's, that's uh, never played. I don't know. Uh, it, it could be anything. But I would personally, I could say uh, as, a, as a huge fan of that song, I would love to see that happen. Um, I also talked to uh, Paul Newton about the song and, uh, you know, I, when I had interviewed him, we talked about it a little bit and he said that uh, he preferred the, uh, the version, like doing it without the orchestra, he thought was, was more enjoyable for him. And, um, you know, but he said it was an interesting experiment and it sounds good. Uh, he said that uh, this is, um, I just asked him again the other day for, you know, a little bit uh, more thoughts on the song specifically. He said, uh, David sang magnificent, mag I can't speak. David sang magnificently, and mixed guitar was perfect, as it usually is, of course. Um, Bass-wise, it gave him the opportunity to really just go for it. And, uh, and he always loved playing the song. And we'll see those spots, too, when we get into it. There are some pretty amazing grooves, um, especially during the section where Mick is soloing. There are times when I really focus on what Mick is doing, and there's times I really focus on the bass and the keyboards because it's just such a great groove that the two of them are playing there. Um, he said, um, it, it, and it was perfect for Keith Baker who played so well on it. And, and he did. Absolutely. There's a lot of stylistic changes in this song and it's a lot to keep up with, but, uh, in the recording, and I don't know, you know, what the recording was like of the song, but in the recording, Keith, uh, really jumps from one to another, uh, right with everybody else. It's, it's great. Um, Paul went on to say that it's a track that he didn't listen to for a long time, but more recently, um, he appreciated the great skills of his fellow musicians to pull it off. And, You'll see if you're not familiar with this track, you'll see what it uh, how epic it really is. And I don't use the word epic a lot, but when I do, I, I mean it. Um, and he said uh, it has a lot of great feeling uh, and soul by the band. And it was never again performed after 1971. Now, I did a little bit of digging and uh, and I went on YouTube. How hard is it to dig for anything on YouTube, really? And uh, and I just did a search for Uriah Heap Salisbury Live and I did find one video that I thought uh, had a pretty good audio quality to it. Uh, I think you could hear everything reasonably well. I wouldn't have mixed it this way per se, but I think overall it's not bad for, for a live video. It might have been a board mix. I'm not sure. But uh, I've got the link in the show notes if you guys want to check that out and see what the song was like without the orchestra, because honestly, I could see how it stands alone, you know? But I also am so used to it with the orchestra, and I think that they they did so much to enhance those uh, those areas that were kind of left open um, and really strengthen a lot of things. Like when the when the some of the progressions come in and, and the transitions to change from one part to another, the brass is just so strong there. It's very well mixed, and um, you know it's it's kind of hard for me to hear it without it, only because I'm used to it. But if I can try and separate myself from that. It's actually really good. And I get Paul's point on that. Um, now, I knew this before, but when I talked to Ken, I kind of reaffirmed this. Ken did not read music. 
And so you would think as uh, as a primary writer, as somebody who's doing the keyboards, who's got the rhythmic and the melodic side in this song, um, you would think that he would have arranged the, the orchestra or, or, or uh, been at the forefront of that. The actual orchestrator was a guy named John Fitty. And I, I would imagine he worked very heavily with the guys on how to, uh, you know, where to bring things in, what they wanted and didn't want to enhance the song. I'm sure there were lengthy conversations. And, you know, when, when you have guys that don't read music, music, and this is in the early 70s, it's not like he could do a MIDI mock-up like we can do now and say, hey, this is the idea I had. What do you guys think? I mean, there was none of that back then. And so it, it had to be, this is how it's going to sound. Let's record it and and just go for it and see what happens. You know, you've paid for the musicians anyway. So I, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall during some of these meetings or the recording process itself. I think it would have been absolutely fascinating. And I don't, I don't know if they were recorded together or how it was all done. The sound quality of the band sounds like it was recorded in the studio with everyone else. And then I, I would imagine that the orchestra was brought in afterwards and playing along to the band's recording. Um, but I can't be sure. I, I don't know how it was done. So uh, maybe we'll find that out down the line. But definitely a, a, an epic song, as as, uh, as Paul noted, it was very experimental. You know, there weren't a lot of people in the rock industry that were working with orchestras. It was very, um, it was it was pretty taboo. I mean, in the pop world, you had the pop working with a lot of um, string players and, and small brass sections. If you think about uh, Motown, think about guys like Gene Pitney and uh, doing Heartbreaker, and you've got some brass and you've got some strings in there. Uh, that was very common with him. But when it came to, you know, heavy distorted guitars and progressive rock music, you didn't really see a lot of that. Now, in uh, in 69, you had Deep Purple doing the concerto with group and orchestra, and they did that with the uh, the London Symphony Orchestra. And, um, you know, a lot of those guys in the orchestra were not very keen on doing the job, but they did it. And, um, you know, there was a lot of, um, I don't want to say snobbery, but from the interviews that I've heard with different guys in the band, mainly John Lord. Um, there were certainly some of that uh, looking down at people that had to play through an amplifier sort of uh, mentality. But the overall thing, I think, was pretty groundbreaking and, and maybe opened the door a little bit for this kind of thing. But but I think it was it was there before with pop music, but maybe this kind of uh, opened the door for orchestras to be playing with um, you know heavier bands and, and really doing a, a good job of bringing the same power that the band was through their instruments. Because if if the trumpets were playing really soft, um, you know, it's it's just not going to really bring it out. But w- you'll see during some of these passages, like I said, where the, the orchestra is, they're playing just as hard as the band is. And it's really nice to see that because it just brings a level of power in this song and some of these swells that uh, really is just phenomenal to my ears. Now, before we get into this song, um, there is one other thing. Now, we this is the last official track on the album. We do have one more song that we will be covering on Thursday. I say we, but it's it's me. But uh, we have this one more track that we're going to cover on Thursday that is a bonus track. So Salisbury is the last track that is an actual released album track. And in my version of the album that I had in America, Salisbury was the last track. I think on, on some of them, I think it was Simon the Bullet Freak or High Priestess, maybe. I think Simon the Bullet Freak. Uh, I didn't have the European version, so I'm not sure. But in this case, uh, in my case, it was Salisbury. So that's why I did them in this order. And, you know, it's a nice build up for the rest of the album to get to this song. And uh, since this is the last one, I'm going to go ahead and announce the contest. Now, I said from the beginning that this show is not about me and anything that I do other than this podcast. And that is true. However, I do have a bit of a crossover with this album and a song that I wrote that was inspired by one of the riffs on a song on this album. I'm not going to tell you which one, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give away a digital download of any Uriah Heep studio album of your choice. And that can either be through Amazon or iTunes. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll work out the, the country logistics, uh, depending on where, where you are when you win. But I want you guys to A, find my SoundCloud. The song is on SoundCloud. And then B, I want you to tell me which song it is and which song it was inspired by from the Salisbury album. Shouldn't be too difficult. It really shouldn't be too difficult. But 
I don't know. I have thought that my contests in the past on my other podcast and that I've done on Facebook and stuff, I thought that they were pretty simple and they haven't been. So I think this is pretty straightforward. If you guys disagree, let me know. And here's how it's going to work. You just need to send me an email at UriahHeapPodcast at gmail.com. You can find that link in the show notes as well. And um, just write me there. Tell me that what song it is and which song you think inspired it. And the first person to do that will be the winner and will win the free Uriah Heap album. So should be fun, good times. But like I said, normally the show is not about me. I'm not here to promote my own stuff, but I happen to have a crossover with this album and I thought it would be a fun contest to do. So uh, start working on that. And uh, I look forward to hearing your thoughts. And, uh, and now... Without further ado, we're just going to get into the song. Here is Salisbury from Salisbury. really wish I could remember what it was like the first time I heard this because, you know, coming off of the last couple of songs and going into this, it, it's very out of place to have the orchestra coming in at all because we've seen very little classical instruments on this album. I and mean, we had a little bit of strings and that was it. So this is really um, kind of a shocker to hear coming into this song, but it's it's just layered so beautifully and, and there's such a presence. You've got some really powerful brass. You've got some uh, emotional woodwinds. You've got that all backed by Ken Hensley on keyboard. It's uh, it's just powerful. And then when the vocals come in, um, they they kind of sound at times like a like a choir anyway, with the harmonies and, and just the higher registers than you hear in other rock bands. But uh, man, this just just so work, works so beautifully with the orchestra. And it's just one of those things where you're like, you're on the edge of your seat, just having to know what comes next. And you know that you're in for a ride with this song right off the bat. There is just so much going on here. So many uh, sounds layered together. So much power. And that swell on the uh, the Hammond B3 from Ken is just absolutely amazing. And there is, uh, there's some really good, powerful swells. In fact, when I interviewed Ken, we talked about, uh, you know, his use of the Hammond B3. And, you know, he said that he's doing things with the B3 that were just, it was not designed for. The B3 was originally designed to be a blues organ. And what uh, what guys like Ken Hensley and John Lord did with this, you know, running it through distortion, um, really just pushing it through the Leslie's and, and just taking everything that they can with it. Um, certainly these kind of swells and, and the power that you'll hear 
coming from the Hammond in this song is just astounding. And that was just a little taste of what's to come. The other thing that uh, I didn't notice uh, growing up listening to this song, in fact, it wasn't until I got this uh, deluxe edition and heard the song that I noticed in that little section that I just played, was there is a nice little pulse that's being built by Ken uh, with his left hand on the lower registers of the keyboard. Just a dun, 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 dun. And, uh, and that kind of throws back to something that we'll hear a little bit later. But it's kind of a faster pulse than the song a little bit. And, uh, and, it, and it just kind of layers in there nicely. I'm really glad that I'm able to hear that now because I think it just adds another level of the intensity of what's going on here. But so far, we're, we're almost two minutes in already. And this has just been nothing but just raw power and emotion. And uh, it, it's just, you know, I was hooked from the very beginning, but they're just they're just stringing me right along to see what happens next. And uh, as you heard at the very end of that clip, now we're going to have the introduction of drums as well. It's just a roller coaster of, of things already, and I love as uh, as Paul's playing the uh, the eighth notes on the bass there. What the the uh, flutes are doing, just that and uh, I think Ken's playing along with that too. Uh, really, really astounding and a great clean recording. I have to say too, um, to the engineer's credit, there is a, there's just a great mix on this song. I think everything is spot on. And I, I don't know that I could have mixed it this well. I certainly know I couldn't have mixed it any better because you really do get to hear everything. It's very crystal clear and uh, really, really well done. So as we continue on through the song, that's something I think that we'll all be able to appreciate. But the performances here are just are just staggering. I really wish I could uh, talk to some of the musicians in the orchestra that played on this. I would love to get their thoughts thinking about, you know, 1971 and what this was like. Uh, I think that'd be absolutely fascinating. But in any case, uh, we have the song to enjoy, and uh, we're just going to go into the next section now. I love those little brass wells that that's really, really cool, um, really adds a, a lot, I think, to this section. And then Mick coming in and uh, he's a little bit on top of, of everyone else. And then just that that last section, the precision of that is just fantastic. Uh, Ken's got some good stuff that he's playing in there. Everything just sounds so nice and rich and uh, and really powerful. I, I just love the whole opening of the song is fantastic, and we're at uh, we're at three minutes, a little over three minutes now. We haven't heard a vocal, which is not, you know, I mean, it's it's a little bit longer than you get used to from Uriah Heep, but it's not uncommon for them to have longer musical passages before a vocal, but nothing this this uh, this long or this epic. I mean, basically, you know, when you have a band that has a lot of songs that are four minutes and under, uh, which was very common at the time. And uh, we're now just over three minutes. I mean, you could fit in almost an entire song into what we've heard. And we're still in the opening section setting this song up. Right now, we're about to get into the vocal. But uh, it's been quite a journey to get here. And uh, it's, it's just so overwhelming how powerful this song really is. I never really thought that I would lose my 
So now we've been through our first verse, and uh, it's lovely, again, to to hear David Byron just singing so gently and so passionately, and he, he really brings it up at the end. And uh, the, the music that's going on to support him, um, you know, you've got the hits from the band, and then you've just got these little, uh, wonderful little fill-ins from the brass section, which I, I really like. I think they add a lot to it. it. It would sound okay if it was just the band doing the hits, and and then... You know, David singing. We've heard that from the band before. Uh, it's part of their style, but uh, with the orchestra in there, it really ha- enhances the uh, the background a-, a lot. Even just doing simple things sometimes can make the biggest difference, and I think this is a great example of that. So, uh, so now you know David's all hot and bothered, and uh, we're going to see what he talks about next. Now, if you notice, David is singing with uh, a little more power in this verse, but there's some other stuff going on, too, that's really interesting. The brass is now uh, working on the hits with the band, and now the woodwinds are coming in and doing the uh, the little colors that you hear. Um, strange to, to hear the word colors because you think visual, but, the, but they're musical colors that you hear uh, filling in where the brass was filling in before, but they can't because now they're doing the hits with the band. So... You know, you can't you can't play in every space, especially if it's an instrument that's breathing with guitar. You can with keyboards, drums, all that bass you can. Um, but with an instrument that takes your actual breath, you can't be everywhere. So they divided that up very nicely. And it's it's really interesting. And then at the end of that, uh, there's I, I don't know who is doing it. I want to say it's a part of the brass section, but there's some really beautiful arpeggios going on underneath all of that. And um I have to think it's part of the brass section. It doesn't really sound like woodwinds. It could be keyboards. I'm not sure, but it's it's definitely very well written and very well performed, whatever it is. So now that we're at the end of this verse and you can see that there aren't really choruses here, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this episode down into smaller bites for you guys, because I know that a lot of people uh, tell me that they listen to this on their morning commute or on a break or things like that because the episodes are a little more bite-sized than than my other show. But I think because this is going to be such a long one, I think I will keep it kind of bite-sized at places. Now, the section that we're about to go in is uh, is a little bit bigger. So I think this would be a good place to cut it. And uh, that way you guys can listen to this. And then you know, if, if the episode is two hours long, sometimes it's really hard to find where you were at. And sometimes your player uh, will reset your location. And I don't want to make you guys go through all that. So I'm going to cut this episode here and then we'll see you in part B. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. Please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.
Happy days. <laughs>